Thank you very much. We'll now open up to questions for the panel. So firstly, if I go back to the one that um, was with respect to the philosophy. So they were asking um, if you took maths and philosophy, would that be detrimental or are there specific roles that um, would give you opportunities? Anybody feel they can answer that one? Uh, I, I know a couple of people that I did my undergraduate with who, who did mathematics and philosophy. Um, I don't see, person, from knowing the sort of stuff that they did, the maths they did in their course, I personally wouldn't see that there would be any, I can't see that how there would be any barriers to someone having studied maths and philosophy. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Any other thoughts from the panel? Well, I will say that there is always research also in applied math. I mean, every department has, an, uh, every faculty has a, a department of applied math. There's a lot of basic uh, science research do with respect, done with respect to, to applied math. So it's everywhere. Thank you. Howard, you might be muted. Use it so often that. Uh... Every single time, but <laughs> this kind of happens when you're in when you're in train. Um, I was going to say that there is a obviously a close connection between uh, some aspects of philosophy and mathematics. So, you know, um, uh, just when I finished my well, actually, just before I finished my PhD, uh, I was doing a lot of work looking at deontic logic. Um, so, essentially, just looking at sort of you know propositional calculus, predicate calculus, and looking at various philosophies as they integrate with um, with mathematics and I think that there is a very close connection certainly in the world of computer science um, and you know producing uh, semantics if you will for programming languages uh, there's certainly a, a very good route that somebody who did philosophy and mathematics could choose to go down so it's more academic or could be on the applied side as well um, you know, I know that when I was at JP Morgan, for example, although not a mathematician, um, the, the, the fellow who uh, was, I guess my boss's boss, uh, had studied PP at Oxford um, and was very much of a philosopher, but had to be very, very analytical um, because, you know, you were dealing with uh, derivatives, very complicated products, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think it was more the philosophy than the economics that kind of helped him to be able to do that. So I would say that, yeah, maths and philosophy definitely can work together. Thank you. So to the panel, but probably most specifically to Howard and Ken, who worked more in the economics and the finance aspects. So would you suggest there are different job prospects, whether choosing pure maths or applied maths courses or modules? Okay, do you want to kick off? I must to say, I'm sorry, I was I was reading this question and I was thinking that that, that was the, the question that we were answering before. Sorry, sorry about that. It was when I heard Howard and I thought, what was it about? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so you already have my answer. <laughs> okay, Marina. So I think Ken has an answer that Linda will give us if she comes off mute. Yes, thank you. I think for a job, for example, in the civil service, like me, as a government statistician, I don't think it matters, to be perfectly honest, as long as you can evidence that you have core skills that you can then translate to, to any, any role. So it doesn't matter which way you go. If there's a specific job, for example, um, if it's an economic and financial ad advisor or uh, something like that, then if you, you're talking about maths with economics. And it it's all depends on what kind of job we're looking for and what kind of financial area you want to work in. And it, 
you could separate them, but I think there are so many overlaps that we will be looking for core skills rather than the extreme skills. Now, maybe Howard has um, a different kind of perspective that he'd like to add to that, but from my perspective, that's all I'd like to say. I, I would echo what Ken has, has just said, but I, I'd also add that, you know, when you look at, for example, investment bank that I spent quite a lot of my sort of years in finance working in, um, you have different segments of an investment bank. So you have what they call a front office. You have a sort of, you know, front, think of the thing front offices where traders are trading um, and you have a mid office where you have um, maybe some marketing and structuring and, and risk management individuals. And, and then you have a sort of back office, which is more um, the accounting functions, if you will, and the sort of trade reconciliations. Uh, and, you know, if you had somebody who had a more pure mathematical skill, you may find that individual working in research, for example. So that person may be working on, let's say, equity derivatives or foreign exchange re or fixed income research. Um, so they might be on the front office working in a particular area perhaps coming up with new models. Um, if you had an applied mathematician, that individual uh, might actually be building models. Um, so, you know, what you might find is that that applied mathematician is actually doing much more programming than mathematics. Um, so they're sort of doing more rapid prototyping of financial products. A pure mathematician is perhaps you know, writing uh, papers on stochastic differential equations um, and solving new types of problems and implementation of that may well be done by somebody who is perhaps more suited towards doing that. So I do agree with Ken, it's just that, you know, in a specific instances within a financial institution, you may find that if your mathematicians end up doing more research oriented stuff, writing papers and the applied mathematicians actually hacking code. Thank you, Howard. So, uh, Ah, Marina. There's something that I, I came across recently while, while teaching about uh, uh, some differential curves. And, 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 we, uh, and I think that it's a very nice uh, story to tell you, but which will tell you something about this apply and math uh, and pure math in, in, in companies. It happens that there, there are some curves called Bezier curves, and these are used for, for you know, to model the cars, actually in Renault cars and Peugeot. Actually, the guy who was working at Peugeot had to invent a professor called Bessier, who never existed, <laughs> and the course are named with this imaginary professor because he thought that it was too new and it was something that it was had to be developed for, for the people. And he was a, a guy working there at the company, and then he thought that the colleagues would think that he was a, a freak. <laughs> So he invented the, the professor, and now this, this course are, teach, are taught at university, as you can see, and also developing the, the shape of Peugeot and Renault cars. So I, just to tell you that story, I thought it was enlightening somehow. I didn't know that, Marina, and I have colleagues who have used those frequently, so I will tell them that and see whether they know that. I see I've never existed. <laughs> So, so a bit of a wider question then to all the panel. Do you have any recommendations on how to construct a strong mathematics CV and show your passion for the subject? Uh, maybe go to Ben because uh, it's nice to hear different perspectives and then we'll go around and see what people's thoughts are. Sure. <laughs> um, so I've actually had to put together my CV over the last couple of months. Um, I've been doing this relatively recently um, in trying to find a job post PhD. Um, I guess if you've got a passion for the subject, there's probably a good chance that you will have done things outside of your degree or whatever it might be that are math related that you might not remember, you know, might not necessarily realize is a really useful thing to have on your CV. So any kind of extracurricular thing you've done, whether it's there's, uh, oh, what's it called? The UKMT math challenges at schools, the, you know, any, any kind of extracurricular activities, but not just, doesn't necessarily have to be specifically maths related. I think Ken mentioned before that in the, in the sort of, should you choose pure or applied math, it's more about 
the skills that you learn as a mathematician allow you to then learn any specific content. So if you can demonstrate those skills of, I think Kendra said again, about communication and, and, and being able to work in team and being able to work on problem solving, I think that will go a long way to showing that you've got the skills that are, that are required. And don't be afraid to say in your PhD that you, if, sorry, in your CV that you have a passion for mathematics. You know, I have a little two or three line personal profile in my CV that just, I think, and there is a line in there, something like, you know, I'm passionate about maths and science as well as, you know, other interests that I have. So go out, say it, <laughs> tell them that you're passionate about it. Thank you, Ben. And, th and that's something that we encourage everyone to keep. Um, as we've said earlier, a lot of the roles don't advertise as mathematics mathematicians and therefore you, you can almost get um, a mathematician's anonymous where people don't come up and stand up and say I am a mathematician so it's really unusual when you see that in a CV and it makes people get interested and pick up their ears so that that is a really really good hint. Anybody else? Howard, uh, we're not hearing you. Are you hearing me now? Yes. Right. So I think what might be important is, is really just to uh, tailor the CV uh, to the application, uh, to the job. And it, and it may well be that for a particular role. So, for example, it might be that a role that an Atkins requires you to understand things like uh, reliability analysis. Um, and so you... You know, if you study statistics, then you'd want to basically say, I've done a lot of, you know, Bayesian analysis, so I really understand that very well. So you'd want to tease that out and put that on your CV for that particular role. But it may well be that if you're applying for a different type of organization, um, you may want to accentuate something that, that's somewhat different. So you're, you know, you're experiencing um, calculus, for example, you know, different aspects of calculus and say, well, you know, this, this is what I do and I do well, you know, stochastic processes or whatever the case may be. So I think having one CV is, is clearly not advisable. Um, and, you know, sort of modifying or tweaking the CV somewhat to bring out the precise mathematical um, thing that you are a god at um, is, is kind of useful when you're applying for that job that you really, really want to get. <laughs> Can I just add to that, do make sure though, if you quote a particular project on your CV that you brush up on it. Um, I had an instant in um, an interview panel a couple of weeks ago where I thought a question would be really easy for the um, candidate because it was on something that they'd listed having used statistically recently and it fell flat and everybody feels bad in that situation and it doesn't necessarily show you in the best light so um yes do do stress and tailor it to the right um audience of that company or research institute that you're applying for but make sure that you do know and have brushed up on that area <laughs> So we have another question now. Um, I'm studying a language alongside my degree. In what ways will this help with my job prospects? Um, so I'll put a um, possible answer to you from my perspective. So um, a lot of the corporate affiliates at the IMA have branches in different countries and many of their graduate training schemes actually require you to do um, maybe a term in each so having that as a ability to start with is phenomenal uh, i i can so brief sorry ken go on sorry thank you for that um i am bilingual I can speak, as it were, in BSL and I can write in English, um, but I think it's okay to be able to use two languages, but you have to be able to communicate, my point from before, you have to be able to communicate well in those two languages. And 
very recently, I know that bilingualism has become quite a hot topic and people are looking for multi-skilled and multilingual people. So yes, I would say that. And I've been an advocate of bilingualism and communication for the longest time. So in one way, you're asking the wrong person because this is what I would always say, that communication with bilingualism or multilingualism, um, I don't know whether other people would feel differently, but that's what I'd like to add. Perfect. Ben? Yeah, uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I yeah, couldn't agree more with what Ken said, but I think also two two things that I would say. I for me, there's something I meant to say in my talk, I it doesn't get uh, potentially some people wouldn't would probably disagree. I I see maths as a very, very creative subject. I think maths and science are incredibly creative subjects. It winds me up when people talk about science and then the creative subjects like art and things like that. If you want to do science and maths, part of that is being able to think creatively about problems. And maths fundamentally is a language for thinking about problems. There's a lot of crossover skills between being able to learn different languages and being able to look at mathematics problems and thinking, how do I address this problem? So if you can make that link, that's only going to help your employers who might, employees who might not have thought about it from that perspective. Secondly, just from a less uh, mathematical point of view, having language skills just opens up your options in terms of where you can work you know if if you want if you see a, the most amazing role that would perfect you but it's in say italy and you don't speak any italian it might be a barrier it might not be a barrier but if you already speak italian but not going to so i don't think i don't think there's any downside to learning more languages and over to marina well um i will say that of course um as a, as a story, I mean, the, one of the typical topics of conversation in a, in a workshop <laughs> during lunch <laughs> is, is always talking about other languages. This, uh, uh, I mean, mathematicians like to think about uh, grammar and, and even though it sounds, it sounds weird, no? it, sounds, it sounds arid and, and very, very boring, but you will have to think that syntactics and grammar are, are something that were where mathematics was was built on in the very I mean I'm talking about the ancient Greek Greeks uh, first century before Christ where they already knew that uh, the radius of the earth of the of earth it, it was in third century before before Christ that they, they compute the radius of the earth so imagine and they were building on grammar and then they built arithmetic and geometry and astronomy on grammar and syntaxes and so on that. Just the strength, I want to, to, to support ben, 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 Ben's point. And from other point of view, I, I also supporting his point is that um, you think on, on different languages, for instance, you have a saying that is, there is always a silver lining no? on the edge of the clouds or something like that. In Spanish, it's said uh, like, no hay mal que por bien no venga. Yeah, it's, it's completely different. I mean, that doesn't, doesn't say anything about clouds, <laughs> nothing about silver lining, but it means the same. And you know, I, I, all the mathematicians that I know, they speak at least French and English, uh, German and English, German, English, mathema uh, mathematics is a language, <laughs> French, Italian, Spanish. I even have a friend that speaks Russian, um, English, French, Italian, and Spanish, and Portuguese, because, you know, romantic languages are always the same. <laughs> Uh, Romance language, I will say. <laughs> Sorry for, for the this change. I, it's now a year be, outside UK and I forgot all my, my English. Sorry about that. But it, it's important. I will say that it, it will help you for sure. Fantastic. Thank you, Marina. I'm aware we are over time, um, but we're happy to continue answering your questions for a little bit, I believe. Just looking around the panel for nods. Yep, we, we can go a little bit longer um, and anything we don't get to, I'm sure we can provide you with a text answer and get that to you. I know Keris was um, collecting emails and things like that. So um, if you don't get your answer, then um, hopefully we'll get it to you that way. Um, so the next one is I'm looking to do an industrial placement for my third year. Which sector should I look for? 
um, as none are specific maths roles. So my best advice would be go and look at the IMA corporate affiliate companies. Those you know will have discussed how to do good year in industries for mathematicians, how to make sure that your professional development is supported and you are given good placements that challenge you, but you also have a supported network. So when you go there, um, you'll then have to look for the career sites probably of each company because one of the problems is not all of them are on things like grad tracker and a lot of internships are advertised in the same way as their normal full-time roles so I, I would suggest that is a good way to do it um, also look for what you enjoy so although traditionally we'd say finance, um, energy sector, defence, um, universities often also add internships. Um, have a look at that. Have a look whether your university has um, specific contacts already. And another thing to bear in mind might be what are your localities so some <clears throat> some people don't necessarily want to have to move to the other end of the country for either an internship or a summer studentship so those are things to bear in mind does anybody else have thoughts on that no okay then so Right, so with elective modules, so I would have called that uh, options, when you're choosing your module options, um, should I keep it based in maths and expand such as accountancy or something, or do you think it will matter if I choose different models, modules in English, biology, space or whatever? Would jobs look down on the variety and see it as a sign of confusion or lack of dedication or whatever? Um, personally, I liked to choose a thread that um, demonstrated kind of my interest, so that was numerical analysis, but I also liked to choose some really weird, weird and wacky ones that I thought would just be fun. You need a little bit of a lighter side as well, so um, I chose things like fractals and uh, space and quantum and things just to show, and I don't think that was ever looked down on. Uh, very rarely will a company go so far as to look at your transcripts, so you can highlight the modules you want to when you tailor that CV, but a little bit of breadth of different application areas will teach you a lot, not just about applying your mathematical knowledge to different problems, but also communicating with people who have different points of view. Uh, so that's my thinking uh, to the panel. Ben? I, I have uh, relatively strong feelings about this. Um, my my first answer would be do the do the modules you enjoy do the modules that interest you the most they are for, for a, a number of reasons firstly that if you're interested in them, you're more likely to do well in them secondly what jenny said it's very rare that companies will actually look, go down and look at the specific modules you've done in your degree um so if you pick the modules you enjoy and you and you're interested in you do well in them it's more likely to boost your overall mark in your degree um and also it might throw up a different area of work or a career that you hadn't quite considered or that's slightly related to what you've done. It just it, The more you can kind of keep your horizons broad, um, especially if you're not necessarily completely certain in what you want to do. Uh, but yeah, my, my as, as someone who started off in a maths degree, then did a physics degree and is now doing biology, um, I, I would only ever encourage someone to if they've got interests in a lot of varied areas it's not a bad thing perfect marina i i, I just want to strengthen his point that um, there are many studies actually in saying that uh, you you are going to be good at what you like the most independently of your talents i will say i mean you build up your talents in a way i mean you will have some basis but 
you build out your, your talents. But I'm assuming that you want to be the best at what you do. It's very difficult to be the best at what you do if you don't like what you do. <laughs> That's as simple as that. So do what you like, always, always, and enjoy it. I mean, life is too short for doing others, others otherwise. <laughs> Very, very wise words. So, Marina, another one that I think will be a good question for you. Oh, sorry, Ken, to you. Sorry to interrupt, but I couldn't agree more with what Marina's just said. Um, I think the best advice is if you have a passion, go for it, go with it. Um, and when you think about it, um, I'm involved with the recruitment process and we recruit people who are interested in what they do and it can be that the application forms state that people are interested in a variety of things and have qualifications in a variety of things but I'm looking for when we recruit um, the team are looking for people who have experience to a degree but also a wide variety of interests. And no, we're not bothered when it comes down to it, to a certain degree. So I agree with everything that everybody has said so far. And to summarise, as Marina and Ben have said, well, Marina particularly, life is too short. So pick something that you really enjoy and commit to that. Give it your best. Perfect. So to Marina first, any advice on how to start developing research skills now as somebody's aiming to go into research academia and would like to start building their abilities now? So we are thinking on abilities, not CV. I mean, because if you are talking about CV, I would say, okay, join every kind of event that the university is doing about modeling or whatever, and join everything. But if you are talking about abilities, I will, I will, you know, I will say that as a professor, I mean, I will say that I very much like when a student comes and say, hey, I, for instance, today, somebody did a, a, an exercise completely different than I thought, very elegant, and, and it was amazing. Actually, we have some semi-presential kind of teaching now, so I'm, I'm at the university and some students are there and the other ones are online and there are boys off <laughs> say hey you're amazing how did you come to that to that idea i mean there was another student congratulating this student so every every exercise everything that you are doing think it twice think it further not only for the exam go further and if you are not sure of what you thought further was right go to your teacher to sorry to your lecturer uh, that's a, what, that's why we are there. I mean, that's the reason for us for being hired. Otherwise, you would have just a YouTube video. So ask us and go and follow us and ask, us, can, can I go further? What is af after that? What, what can I get more? I mean, uh, from this that you're teaching us always, because there's always much more. I mean, it's like when you knew real numbers and then somebody told you about complex numbers and the square root of minus one. And it was like, what the hell? That exists. <laughs> and, and you didn't even imagine that. So that's what you have to do. Uh, I will say in a very bad way, maybe suck all the knowledge from your lecturer <laughs> and try to do it yourself too. Newton did his Principia Mathematica in this year that where there was an illness, uh, a pandemic actually, uh, and did his Principia Mathematica because he was alone for a year, plenty of time for doing mathematics. So I'm very much sure that if we let the students have a year of doing whatever you want, you will build new mathematics just by yourselves. So try it. Thank you, Marina. I think there's also an aspect of um, why, why not um, try something like um, Plus Magazine, which is um, a very, an excellent um, magazine for mathematics or chalk dust. Find an article that you're really interested in. It might have some references. See whether you can have a look at those references and if you can follow those and then do some of your own Googling and some of your own research and see where that leads you because that those are exactly the research skills that you're looking to generate. Yeah, I, the two very quick, one which is very similar to yours actually Jenny, that I think one of, 
one of the biggest research skills is the ability to, to read other research critically and kind of not just passively read through it. So if you can find uh, Quanta is a really good website that has articles that goes into quite high level in all areas of maths and science, but presents it in quite an accessible way. So like Jenny said, read some of those articles and then have a think about, do I have any ideas about this? Look at references that are in there. I think the other research skill, I think that I noticed as a change from taught degree to research degree was that nobody's chasing you or to, to the same extent anyway. Getting into the habit of you driving your own work is a real change, I think, from taught degrees to research degrees. It's not here's this module and you have to find the correct answers. It's here's this problem, go away and think of, not just go away, but you know, think, try and think of ways to address this problem. So if you can find ways of putting yourself into that mindset of you driving your own ideas and research, obviously with support from your from supervisors and things like that, I think that's a, a really good skill set to have. And getting comfortable with being stuck as well. As a researcher, you spend a lot of time stuck <laughs> and wondering how to progress something and actually learning that that's okay and you can you can start to try and think of it things in other ways a few days later and often you become unstuck. So that, that was what I learned as well. Howard, I think you had. Yes, uh, so I agree with what everyone said so far, but I'd also say there's some really basic things that I think um, individuals can do. Um, so for example, uh, going and, 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 you know, Marina mentioned, for example, you know, sort of accumulating a lot of information, which I agree with. And I think that what's important is that you go beyond the subject matter. So you look at all of the adjacent areas uh, as possible, and as plausible within the time frame that you have. Uh, for example, I know that when I was doing my PhD um, and the subject matter was applying uh, a sort of category theoretic approach to specifying communication protocols, uh, very bland, I know. But having said that, um, I pretty much read everything um, adjacent to the work that I was doing. So I, I read a lot of very uh, sort of abstract mathematics um, and try to see what the connectivity could be between the, the, the specific area of maths that I was applying to communication protocols, um, you know, and, and the mathematics that I was using. Um, so for, for me, that was very, very useful because it gave me a broader outlook on the sort of applicability of the work that I was doing. Uh, also, time management is another basic skill. Uh, and, I, and I find that some of the students that I've looked at, they're not particularly good at planning and, and managing time very well. Um, and they're not particularly good at being objective uh, and critical thinking and analysis. So what they will do is they'll read a paper um, and they'll almost regurgitate it uh, without necessarily thinking about what the paper is contributing and how they could actually uh, be more novel. Uh, and this is more acute, for example, when you look at some of the work that I've looked at in mathematical finance, where you can have a paper which, for which you have no proof actually, um, or live very little proof, but the actual proof is probably about 10 pages long. Um, and the students who are looking at the sort of the mathematical finance papers uh, are somewhat struggling to think abstractly as to how the author could have come to that conclusion. So I think, you know, some of the skills are not necessarily um, difficult to master, but if you master them at a very early stage, then it would help you certainly to be a good independent researcher uh, time management project uh, planning, if you will, uh, critical thinking, uh, and being able to think out of the box and go beyond your area of specialism and look at related areas. Fantastic. Thank you, Howard. So our next question is looking into operational research and risk management as a job, especially government operational research. Do you think a statistics module would be helpful needed? Um, so personally, um, yes, it's very useful to have statistics, probably 
particularly on the Bayesian inference statistics areas. It's useful also to, that there's some good open source software that you can have a play with that do things like decision networks. Um, so Netica is one I can think of off the top of my head. You also would benefit from uh, numerical methods courses, which go through optimization, root finding, that kind of thing. Um, not to plug another institute, but there is also the Operational Research Society, which I am also a member of, that um, would have some very good guidance for you and runs um, charity uh, teams that help charities and they are happy to take students on those if you want to build up your experience as well. So anyone else got any thoughts on that one? Nope. Okay, next one then. Uh, when you get to university and are studying maths, what are some things that I can do to develop my skills and CV so other than internships? I would encourage you to get involved with um, university mentoring, uh, also university clubs and societies, um, student unions, because you will at an interview with an employer get questions about teamwork and when you've had challenging situations and those kind of softer skill opportunities give you something to talk about that will be able to tick those aspects of an interview. Um, I'm sure everybody else has thoughts on that as well. Ben? Uh, yeah, thanks, Jack. I'll happy to. Um, yeah, I, I want to echo what you said about uh, societies, clubs, whatever it might be, sport, politics, debating, Whatever, whatever it is you might be interested in, maths related or not maths related, there will be something there for you to do at university. One of the best things about university is there are, you know, courses and clubs and societies for just about everything. Um, I've, one of my absolute favorite things I've done at university and just in my life in general is, is playing rugby league and being involved in running the rugby league societies, which has led to, in the last couple of months, at the end of my thesis, we're actually setting up a we're trying to set up a charitable trust to improve educational access for children from disadvantaged backgrounds through rugby. Um, so that's kind of where that's led to for me. Um, so you never know where it's going to lead. And it's also an incredible thing. It's, you know, if you can get those extra little bits, like Jenny was saying, the side benefit, the, I think the, the primary benefit, be, the prime benefit should be that you're doing something that you enjoy and that you want to do and that you're interested in. But the secondary benefit is looks good on your CV as well. You, you've also got opportunities like most maths departments have a Institute of Mathematics and Applications ac academic rep and they might run chapters. Um, so there is um, some that are twinned with another institute called SIAM and those are worth getting involved with. Often those um, departments often have STEM ambassadors to reach back into um, schools. That is worth doing as well. Over to Howard. Yeah, so I'm a mentor at King's and you know, some of the issues that you've mentioned are uh, very similar uh, you know, to some of the problems I've come across or issues I should say. And what I would say is this, I'd say that pretty much everybody who's applying for a job at a point in time is going to be competing with somebody who has roughly the same skills. Um, so your, your technical abilities are not really going to be the differentiating factor, to be frank. I think what will differentiate you from the crowd will be the extracurricular things that you say you, you have been doing and certainly your soft skills. Um, and certainly if it comes to the point of having an interview, then the soft skills will uh, perhaps on a ratio of 70 to 30 uh, reign supreme because it's a given for example, if you're, you know, you're at a certain university that you're, you've got a good qualification, you've got a good background, um, but it's not a given that you're effectively able to communicate yourself very well or to be able to work in the team or to be able to do any of these other things that we've been discussing as being part of your armory of soft skills that you need to have. So I think, you know, and certainly, you know, what I, what I say to the, to the mentees 
is, is that they clearly need to have their CV together, but the CV only says one thing, but you know, your nonverbal communication also needs to be you know, up to par as well. Perfect answer. Thank you, Howard. Over to Marina. I would say that it's how I so, so, so right. I mean, because your, your soft skills are the ones that are going to differentiate you. I will also say that they then do whatever, I mean, joining with the previous question, um, do whatever you do, uh, whatever you like to do, and be smart. Be smart reflecting on what is it giving it to me. For instance, um, I'm a drummer, so I know what, how the rhythm is joining all together, all the, the players in a band. So then I can tell to uh, in an interview that, okay, I, I'm a very good team player because I do these drums and then I understand the place of everybody in the band and the supporting, the support, the support rhythm of the, of the band. Or I, I did this, uh, I, I was the captain of the rowing team. Okay, you know leadership. So whatever you do, reflect on that and see how you can use it, but do things that you like to be the best on them. And that goes throughout your whole professional career. Never stop thinking about what you are doing and how it adds to you as a person and your skill sets and reflecting on it and thinking where you want to go next. Um, it's a skill that will help you throughout life. So moving on to the next question, we've got quite a few for Howard. So Howard, um, you mentioned ethics and policy decisions with respect to algorithms. I'd be interested to hear any thoughts on this emerging field, what sort of things are involved. We've also got a request for that um, research paper in the books that you mentioned. So if you could put some links that we can share with people, that would be good. Um, and I'm aware that going into analysis jobs in investment banking is very competitive. Are there similar careers perhaps in banking that will allow me to analyse and model data, but also allow me to interact with customers? So there's a good lot for you, Howard. <laughs> Quite a few, yeah. Um, okay, what I, what I would say is this. I'd say that, um, one second. Okay, um, I guess the question, which questions to start off with? So give me the first question, Jenny. So the first question was, you mentioned ethics and policy decisions with respect to algorithms. Obviously, that's very in the news at the moment. I'd be interested to hear any thoughts on this emerging field, what sort of things are involved? Okay. So uh, if you look at IBM, so IBM, uh, Google, for example, are two large organizations which have developed numerous types of analytics in order to ensure that, you know, various machine learning um, or ML applications don't suffer from bias. So we have to understand what is bias. And I think I'd mentioned earlier that in a sense, there are really two forms of, well, two main forms of bias. Uh, one is bias in data and the other one is, is bias in the algorithms itself. Um, so a lot of my interest lies in ensuring that algorithms which are used are not discriminatory. Um, so having said that, the, the problems could be in the data and there are some examples of this. So you can Google Google, if you like, and you can see that Google itself just in 2019 were uh, as part of a, a sort of beta application that they had for recruitment, um, were discriminated against females in regards to uh, certain jobs that they were advertising on, on the grounds that historically, mainly men are computer scientists, mainly men working in AI, mainly men work in technology. And so the sample that they, chose, albeit the fact that it was uh, not a biased sample per se, in as much as it represented history, it was biased in that it didn't prospectively represent the uh, population that could have applied for, for a role, if you understand what I'm saying. So whereas the historical data represented, let's say, 100 people that um, worked at, over the last 10 years, let's say, at Google, uh, let's say 90 were men then the data was correct, but it didn't represent the perspective, the possible um, uh, population of individuals that could apply going forward. So by definition, the data was biased from that perspective and, and would always uh, exclude women. And perhaps if it were predicated on race, it would also exclude 
people like myself. So, um, so I like to look at things like that and, and look to see whether mathematics can be used and to what extent mathematics can actually be used. And obviously, if you're looking at data, then you know there are various statistical techniques that you can use for sampling from a population to, to try and get a better representation. Um, there are other techniques that you can use in order to just to make the data more biased in favor of what the prospective population should be. In terms of the algorithms, this is much, much harder. So you've got sort of deep machine, deep machine or deep learning algorithms, uh, which are completely non-deterministic. And actually it's very difficult or impossible to be able to say how it came to its conclusion. So the issue of explainability becomes a real big factor. And this is an area that I'm also working on um, to try and understand how can we um, have models which are not so complicated. So tree-based models, for example, or uh, logistic regression models, which are perhaps as accurate in, in many respects as more dynamic and probabilistic models. And by using those models, you can actually follow the logic and see how the, the, you know, how the results were produced without any loss of discernible loss of accuracy. So that's a very fascinating area. It's a growing area and, and it's an area which touches on, as I say, um, discrimination. Um, so it's a subject which is very close to my heart. The other question real quick, Jay. Thank you. Yes, I'm on mute. I knew some, somebody would make that mistake and of course it had to be me. <laughs> um, I'm aware that um, we're getting well past time now. So thank you to those that have stuck with us. Last question, Howard, was um, going into analysis jobs in investment banking is very competitive. Are there similar careers in banking that will allow me to analyse model data, but also interact with customers? Uh, I don't know of one. Um, I don't. I don't know of one because the typical customer-facing roles are roles which are more marketing or structuring roles. Um, now it could well be that you're an analytical marketer or structurer, and you want to kind of look at data. Typically, what would happen would be that that would be farmed out to some researcher. Um, so they would they would do that work, and then they would provide the results of that to you, um, and. I wouldn't say so much that there are fine line or there are clear lines of uh, responsibility or segregation between different roles, but typically that the person who's the front office individual dealing with clients doesn't do the data analysis in an investment bank. Um, that tends to be the researcher. Um, but if somebody with those skills wanted to become a front office individual, that would only add value to the organization. Um, because what it would mean then is that any analytics that they're producing, rather than to point the finger at somebody else and blame them, then the finger points back to them. Um, and more in real time, they can actually have, in a sense, they can have um, a sense within which they know that they've got control over the data, control over the model, and so they understand it a lot better rather than uh, a third party, somebody else telling them this is how the model is supposed to work. I think to add to that, Howard, I wonder whether that person might be more interested in working for a contractor who works with banks and also customers. So you get quite a lot of small to medium enterprises that you get to do more variety in the role. You aren't, you aren't in a big company where all you do is the model. You actually get to be involved with every step of the process. So I'm, I'm wondering whether that might be a good way to look at that. It might well be. Um, there are data providers, for example, like you know Reuters, Telerate, Bloomberg are sort of data providers, and there are smaller organizations that provide data. There could well be a space within which uh, sort of uh, somebody who wants to be customer facing but looking at data. So the customer could be the investment bank, for example, um, and you work for a company which produces data and analyzes data. So there could be a role there for somebody who wants to still work within the financial services, but more in the support industry rather than in the financial uh, industry itself, like in the bank, for example. Yeah. 
Fantastic. So at that point, I think it's probably a natural conclusion to say thank you so much for our panellists' time. This has been an incredible set of questions as well. So thank you very much to all participants.